Alexander the Great, the most interesting man in the world. Well, he's got to be one of the coolest historical figures. Only a handful of people have really influenced history as much as Alexander did, and that's why he's one of my faves and why I want to tell a story. But I don't want to talk about him like a boring scholarly lecture, so I'm just going to be keeping it more like a relaxed history lesson, and I'm just going to be keeping it more like a relaxed history lesson and trying not to talk like an alien. So anyways, I'll start. Crowned at 19, died by 32. Dude took live fast, die young to another level. He established the greatest empire of the ancient world, was a general of skill and renown, and spread Hellenic ideas wherever he went. And spread Hellenic ideas wherever he went. One thing with Alexander though that gets debated a lot is not what he did and what he was great at, but rather how he was as a person, like his personality. Some people go on to call him visionary, brilliant, cruel, vengeful, and probably more than a little insane. Honestly, all of that is not too far off. He was a complex guy and can't really put into one category. Like, at times he could be both petty and magnanimous, cruel and merciful, impulsive and farsighted, but above all, he was ferociously competitive and did not like to lose. Luckily, he rarely did. But regardless of what I the guy that's one hell of an influence on the ancient world that for sure would not have been as great if he weren't around. But before getting into Alexander, you sort of need to know a bit about Macedonia and his dad. So here's a quick backstory on our pals the Macedonians and Alexander's old pops, Philip. So, Mac so Macedonia was this territory to the north of Greece formed by the north and northwest ends of the Thermaic Gulf. It's this hard and rugged country and throughout its early history it had always been a tribal society of sorts. And throughout much of its early history as a tribal society, it was made up of like city-states during the same time period. Anyways, the lives most Macedonians led were probably the ancient equivalent to our modern era basic bro. So they hunted, fought, did athletics, and a favorite pastime of theirs and mine, drinking. Like all the time. Some even say they never really stopped drinking. They, they never really stopped drinking. My guess is that if they did, the collective hangover would probably kill them. So, despite the Greeks seeing these people as a bunch of basic bros, Macedonia started to emerge as a true beast in a little over 50 years in the 4th century BC. This amazing ascent really came down to two men. Philip this amazing ascent really came down to two men, Philip II and his son, Alexander the Great. So, when Alexander's padre Philip came to the throne in 359, he was at first glance your typical Macedonian nobleman, a fiery red temper, Excessive drinker, fond of war, horses, and horses, and both women and young boys. But he did possess a keen understanding of the hearts of men and held a boundless vision for Macedonia. But, again, this isn't really Philip's story, so I'll just skip through a bit to summarize his reign. In 358, he invaded Paeonia and defeated the Illyrians. The next year, he married Olympias, the woman by recapturing Amphipolis. In 356, he took with a West Thracian Crenides, renaming it Philippi after himself. Super humble guy. This place was a literal gold mine, thanks to it actually having gold. And over the next two decades, Philip won a series of victories, only suffering a major defeat in Thessaly in 353. So, only suffering a major defeat in Thessaly in 353. So, now we fast forward to Chaeronea in 338, where Philip's army fought against a large assembly of Greek forces. It's there where he won a great victory over the Greeks. And following that, he was able to form up the League of Corinth in 337, which brought almost all the Greek city-states in. Then we get to him receiving the title of hegemon or dominant leader of all Greek armies, basically giving him the authority to attack Persia because he'd be doing so in the name of all Greece. Finally, he got the League of Corinth to sanction his invasion of Persia and began to prepare for the upcoming campaign. Unfortunately, that wouldn't work out. Six. Philip was in Pella, celebrating the marriage of his daughter to Alexander of Epirus, when he was assassinated by one of his bodyguards, Pausanias. Now, with old Philip dead, some stuff went on with Alexander trying to secure his throne, but we'll start at the point where our boy Alexander has assumed the throne. So, now Alexander, King Alexander, so, now Alexander, King Alexander, however, had significant problems. He had to deal with potential rivals among the nobility and handle his now fragile borders. And to just top it all off, as a new king, all those Greek city-states with the grudge against Macedonia were now going to try their luck against the new leadership. 
Thus, he had to deal with all the problems closer to home. So while our new king was dealing with his Macedonian problems, there were these uprising rebellions in the Greek cities who just jumped at the chance to regain independence. All the Macedonian garrisons were driven away, alliances forged, and even secret messages sent to the Persian seeking gold to f and even secret messages sent to the Persian seeking gold to fund their uprising. Then we get the Thessalians and the Thebans who turn on Alexander, Spartans see their chance for hegemony in southern Greece, and the Athenians, led by Demosthenes, who always disliked the Macedonians, declared a day of public thanksgiving. The lame kind without Turkey. The Macedonians declared a day of public thanksgiving. The lame kind without Turkey, and awarded a posthumous crown to Philip's assassin. So not cool stuff at all. So at this point, you'd probably be thinking, okay, a new ordinary leader would probably stay at home, consolidate their native land. But Alex so what he does is he immediately leaves Pella with his army and marches south toward Thessaly and swiftly gets them to recognize him as their leader in his father's place. They then agree to pay taxes to their king and, more importantly, join their dangerously good cavalry to his army auxiliaries. From there he moves south to Thermopylae, convene the Amphictyon. Next up is those pesky Thebans. So at this point, Alexander has pretty much got his foot down on the gas pedal and catches the Thebans by surprise. They think that they're going to have a battle a few months ahead after Alexander secures his borders and whatnot. Well, let's just say they're shocked to see just a few days later, thousands of Macedonian troops surrounding that this boy king was not just some pampered prince, but is and would be an ambitious warlord and clever strategist ready to throw down. So what else are Thebans going to do at that point but surrender? So they did, and accepted Alexander as their sovereign. Athens, hearing about this, and Thebes, um, they're just sort of being a bunch of little girls, and pretty much told them they had nothing to fear. What Alexander did do instead was take his men and head south to the Peloponnesian Peninsula, where he summoned up the League of Corinth, who were quick to affirm him as the leader for life of all Greeks, like his father. Next, in a colorful ploy worthy of the Athenian stage, Alexander brought before the delegates by worthy of the Athenian stage. Alexander brought before the delegates a messenger claimed to be from the Greek city of Ephesus on the west coast of Asia Minor. So this dude was actually just an actor, and he pleaded with the representatives of free Greece to liberate his city from the tyranny of the Persians. And as if on cue, all the league members rose up at the Persians. And as if on cue, all the league members rose up in applause and vowed to help their oppressed countrymen from across the old pond. They then appointed Alexander as general in command of the renewed Panhellenic expedition against Persia. Next, Alexander just happened to have on hand a complete list of men, money, and supplies they were to contribute to this upcoming campaign, including Athens' beloved navy. With these formalities complete and everyone trying to schmooze Alexander, what does he go do? He politely disregards everyone and searches for this guy named Diogenes the Cynic, who was someone he admired. Well, he ended up finding him on the outskirts of Corinth, just enjoying this super confident guy, apparently. So Alexander stood there, just waiting to be recognized, and he wasn't. So he awkwardly asked Diogenes what he could do for him, and this dude told the ruler of Macedonian Greece to move because he was blocking the sun. So at that point, Alexander's friends just started making fun of this guy, calling him a fool, and... So at that point, Alexander's friends just started making fun of this guy, calling him a fool and a madman. And almost immediately, Alexander snapped back at them and said, If I were not Alexander, I would surely be Diogenes. Alright. Anyways, now Alexander starts heading home and makes a detour to the sacred site of Delphi, being sold the oracle on his upcoming campaign. Unfortunately, he was told that the priestess was not available for that day, even for the ruler of Greece. So, what does a sane person do? Exactly. Marked into her lodging and drag her forcibly to the shrine. Grossly sacrilegious, but it had the intended effect because the priestess started crying out, you started crying out, you are invincible. And that's all our perfectly humble king wanted to hear. So he left a modest donation, probably like a 15% tip, you know, the standard. And now he truly was headed home to Pella. But you know what they say, no rest for the wicked. So instead of getting a break at home, Alexander had to deal with Barbara's borders. Alexander being Alexander, so that's just a total pro. This was a chance for him to make an impression on all the Balkan tribes so they wouldn't mess with his kingdom when he was away in Persia. And second, it would be awesome fighting and training for his army. So first, he started marching to Thrace where he invaded and 
pretty much crushed Olha's opposition southwest over the mountains toward the highlands ruled by Langaris, king of Agrianians, who he was pretty friendly with. Uh, he and his army got to rest there, got to recruit some of Langaris' best warriors into his army. There were like these some tough, rugged mountain troops that actually would become a key element of Alexander's forces in Asia. Troops that actually would become a key element of Alexander's forces in Asia. And that was actually probably the earliest instance of Alexander integrating non-Greek or non-Macedonians into his ranks. Which would come to help his army, but that would also become a problem later on for future Alexander. Massing on the border with Macedonia and preparing to invade. Alexander then went to deal with them, honestly with a bit of struggle, and as he was sort of finishing them off, news then came of a revolt in Thebes. So, while he was trying to finish up in Illyria, and hearing of the revolt in Thebes, there was this rumor that began to circulate that he had been killed. Gossip girl Demosthenes, who supposedly produced an eyewitness that swore Alexander was killed. And the guy didn't stop there, he even urged Greece to revolt and again to write to Persia for support. So here the Greek city saw this as a great opportunity. If Alexander was dead, Macedonia was leaderless, and it'd be the best time to strike strike back and reclaim independence. But remember how Alexander is said to have a bit of a temper? Well, Alexander's response to all this, and especially the Theban Revolt, would be just that. Swift, brutal, angry, and red. So, Alexander, knowing all this, Alexander... Knowing all this, hearing what's going on, he just immediately raced his south. Fearing the Thebans would join with the Peloponnesian forces, get Athens navy, and even Persian gold was enough to have him just haul straight there. So the guy marches 20 something miles a day, right at the gates of Thebes before the rebels even knew he was on the way. Right at the gates of Thebes before the rebels even knew he was on the way. And it all sort of goes down like this. Alexander starts off camping near the north city walls, giving the Thebans time to think about their revolt. But the Thebans would have none of it. The first move the Thebans made was to rush out of the gate, attack his troops, and rush back camp south of the city and sends a herald to tell the Thebans he's still willing to forgive them. But instead of them being like, oh, that's probably smart, how kind of you, they actually began to shout that any of them could join Thebes and the great king of Persia against the tyranny of Alexander. And Alexander, upon hearing the Thebans calling him a tyrant, and invoking the idea that the great king of Persia, and invoking the idea that the great king of Persia is the liberator from him, made him just snap. The king flew into a towering rage and declared that he would make an example of Thebes. And with this now burning rage, Alexander laid his plans to wipe Thebes off the face of the map. He eventually burst into Thebes, and his men spread throughout the town. And a scene that followed into Thebes, and his men spread throughout the town. And a scene that followed was a mix of brave fighting and straight savage butchery. Houses were plundered, wives and daughters raped, the old were killed in their bed, and even citizens fleeing the temples were just cut down. Some 6,000 Thebans died that day, and at least 30,000 captive, captives were taken. The walls of the city and many of its buildings were razed to the ground, except some temples, and the city of Thebes effectively ceased to exist from this point on. Although many buildings were rebuilt, it was never again a leading city. Alexander did this to send a harsh message to the ancient Macedonia will be dealt with severely. He was not playing games. Alexander needed to ensure that when he left for Persia, he wouldn't come under any attack at home. However, along with leaving the temples alone in Thebes, Alexander did leave the houses of the descendants of the poet Pindar alone because he liked him. And it's exceptions like that and throughout his Alexander and his personality that honestly sort of border on being bipolar. On one hand, you have fierce brutality, and then it's mixed with some kindness. He sort of reminds me of those Sour Patch Kids in those old commercials, where they would, like, cut your car's brake lines, but then they would dial 911 for you after the crash. That's pretty much Alexander. That's pretty much Alexander. Alright, with all that done, next Alexander moves south. The Athenians, especially Demosthenes, must have been seriously worried that they are about to receive the same straight-up beating that Thebans had. So they scampered on, arranged a meeting, and Athens voted to send an embassy congratulating Alexander. A meeting, and Athens voted to send an embassy congratulating Alexander on his victories in the north and pretty much celebrating the way they dealt with the Thebans. Great. 
Well, not at this point, it's 334, and Alexander finally manages to get Greece back into the position it was before his father's death. He was also now acknowledged death. He was also now acknowledged as the hegemon of the Greek cities and general of the armies. And with his borders secure, he now could complete his father's vision, the invasion of the Persian Empire. All that was left was for Alexander to get ready. So, in late autumn, he recalled Parmenian from Asia Minor to be second in command on the camp to rule Macedonia and keep the Greeks in line. Finally, to ready his troops for war, he held athletic contests, festivals, had them dine like kings. And then, finally, it was time. Time to see what Alexander was known for, being a badass. So with all that set, Alexander was off. His last stop in Europe before it, Alexander was off. His last stop in Europe before Asia was at this place called Eleus, opposite of Troy, where he sacrificed at the tomb of Protesilaus. Excuse my butchering of any and all names. So that guy was the first Greek to reach Asian soil in the Trojan War. Also the first to die. He steered a vessel to the middle of the Hellespont. There he sacrificed to Poseidon and all that good stuff. And then guiding his ship toward Troy, where he approached, he thrusted his spear onto the beach, claiming Asia for himself, leapt ashore, and immediately began making sacrifices. From Troy, Alexander moved north along the Hellespont to Arisbe, where his main miles away from a wealthy city called Lampascus, guarding the north entrance to the Hellespont. Alexander, in desperate need of money to pay troops and fund this campaign, needed Lampascus, but he didn't get it. The citizens were chilling and fine under Persian rule and weren't going to surrender to Alexander. Well, Alexander was pissed, but couldn't waste time besieging the city, even more than money. So moving east, he came across this small town called Priapus, which surrendered to him, and it started making him wonder, like, where the hell are the Persians? Well, they were actually a lot closer than he probably realized, just 20 miles across the Granicus River at the town of Celia, the Persian governors and generals, along with their armies, were plotting on what to do with the Macedonian king. Governors and generals, along with their armies, were plotting on what to do with the Macedonian king. One general there, maybe the best, was this guy called Memnon of Rhodes, and he advised that they should destroy all crops, empty towns, and then launch an expedition on Macedonia. And that advice was probably pretty solid, and might even guarantee that the world never heard of Alexander the Great before. This was probably pretty solid, and might even guarantee that the world never heard of Alexander the Great before. But obviously that didn't happen. The other generals just disagreed with the guy, and convinced Darius to go fight the Macedonians at the Granicus. And it's here at his first battle at the Granicus River in May that Alexander finally saw the Persians. In their current position, he would have to cross the river unprotected, then struggle up the far banks as the enemy struck them from the high ground. Essentially, his service of formation would be useless in that scenario. And that was all done on purpose by the Persians so the Macedonians would be at a weakness. They had set a trap for Alexander and dared him to walk into it. A more cautious general, which is actually what the Persians were counting on. Alright. Now just picture the following battle in the morning, after everyone had their morning coffee or whatever. Alexander was setting up troops and getting ready to go. He arranged his troops in their standard formation, with the horsemen on the wings and foot soldiers in the center. Parmenian got command of it to the left, while Alexander rode to the right. Alexander, wearing his dope armor, sure got his men jazzed up and ready to brawl. And at this point, both sides were set, kind of like this giant game of chess. Neither side wants to make a first move, so Alexander jumped on his horse and moved his right wing forward with the mighty war cry to Ares, God of War. The mighty war cry to Ares, God of War. His strategy was to outflank the Persian cavalry using his two wings, but that didn't work. This game of chess ended up turning into a chaotic cluster of limbs flying and blood spraying everywhere. And at the beginning, it seemed that the Persians were actually winning, but eventually the Macedonians gained a foothold against the shorter javelins of the Persians. Fierce struggles raged as the Persians tried killing Alexander, hoping to end the war with a single blow. And in this giant Smash Bros brawl, at one point the satrap Spithridates charged Alexander from behind to strike him down, but Cletus the Black threw himself at the Persian, cutting his arm off cleanly at the shoulder, Persian cutting his arm off cleanly at the shoulder, saving Alexander's life. And it was around this point that the Persians knew they were the losing side, and so began to run away and retreat. Over a thousand Persian horsemen were killed, including nobles, satraps, and relatives of the king. But that wasn't the end of that. Alexander surrounded all the Greek mercenaries that fought with the Persians. The most likely thought the standard practice would occur where they'd be ransomed and allowed to depart. But like usual, Alexander doesn't follow that basic vanilla lifestyle. He rounded every Greek merc up, 
Then he slaughtered every single one of them, sparing maybe a few for the Macedonian mines. After all this blood and gore, Alexander went around visiting the wounded, ordering burials, shipping luxury goods back home, and one of my favorite things, he sent 300 sats of Persian armor to Athens to be set up on the Acropolis with the inscription, Alexander, son of Philip, and all the Greeks, except the Spartans, sent these spoils from the barbarians in Asia. So the guy was not above having a sense of humor. And with that battle being done, having a sense of humor. And with that battle being done, what was left for Alexander was the whole governing in the Hellespont region thing. Well, he appointed his cavalry commander Callus as satrap and more or less kept everything the exact same as far as administration went. And after dealing with that, he moved from the Granicus and marched south through the, the place with the story of King Croesus and his absurd FU levels of money. This fortified citadel towering above the valley of the Hermes River gave Alexander a pretty good cause for concern when he approached it. But to the relief of Alexander, Mithrinis, the commander of the city citadel, surrendered the town to him without a fight. The delight of Alexander, Sardis, the town to him without a fight. The delight of Alexander, Sardis, and its treasury full of lady and gold now belonged to him. So that looming thought of needing money for his troops in the campaign was no longer there. Now that his troops had some spending money, it got some weight off Alexander's shoulders. At Sardis, Alexander appointed a Macedonian named Pausanias, not the same dude who assassinated his dad. Alexander appointed a Macedonian named Pausanias, not the same dude who assassinated his dad. As a commander of the citadel, put Nicias, a Greek in charge of taxes, and Asander as satrap of Lydia. In addition, he sent most of the Greek troops back to garrison the regions around Troy and Sardis. And those were all pretty solid moves. On one hand, he held left power, se left power separated in three different people's hands to prevent competition among any one man. And with the Greeks, he was able to dispense of them and cast aside the facade that this was still some type of Panhellenic crusade. From now on, it was just a straight up Macedonian war of conquest. After Sardis, Alexander's next went down the same night Alexander was born. Well, arriving at Ephesus, Alexander seized the city, and at the same time, representatives from the surrounding towns arrived, offering their surrender to him. He of course accepted, but sent Parmenian the cavalry to their towns to make sure they were like for realsies. Um, there's actually this fun story about Alexander when he was in Ephesus, who was from there. So, of course, Alexander wanted a killer portrait of himself atop his horse, Bucephalus, from the guy. However, when the painting was finished, Alexander was not too impressed. So, Apelles showed it to Alexander's horse, Bucephalus, who neighed in apparent approval. Apelles then proceeded to tell Alexander that his horse had better taste in art than fine art, didn't like that, and more or less told him to try again. Apelles smartly played to Alexander's vanity the next time, and he painted him as Zeus wielding a thunderbolt. And, well, that worked out, because Alexander was happy and just gave the guy a bag of gold. Alright, so artwork aside, and after, Ephesus, and after Ephesus, Alexander took the rest of his army and left for the key city of Miletus, 30 miles south, stopping at a small Ionian town called Priene along the way. There, he decided to visit this newly completed temple to Athena, designed by a guy named Pythias, the same architect... Uh, who built the mausoleum of Halicarnassus. Pythias, the same architect uh, who built the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So at that temple, Alexander donated enough money so he'd be named patron of the temple. And, well, it worked, because one of the few pieces of contemporary evidence we have naming Alexander is actually that dedicatory inscription, is actually that dedicatory inscription of the temple to Athena in Priene. So moving on from that, now Parmenian and the rest of the army met up with Alexander and his men around Miletus. It was this ancient settlement dating back to the days of the Trojan War and a pretty big naval center. And it was that naval ability of sheltering a- He knew the great king had some 400 ships operating in the eastern Mediterranean as opposed to his own less experienced fleet that was probably half that size. Uh, funny enough though, it seemed like Alexander would get a lucky break because the commander of the garrison at Miletus first sent a message offering to surrender, but joke first sent a message offering to surrender, but jokes, because when that guy then heard the Persian fleet was near, he immediately went back, seized on Alexander, and barred the city gates. Alexander then ordered his small fleet to race for Miletus to prevent the Persians from seizing the harbor. First thing was first, and Alexander sent his engineering corps to knock down the mashed up a solid amount for his men to go through. They swarmed the town, killed defenders, and headed for the harbor. 
There, the Greek fleet moved in to blockade the Persians from landing reinforcements. And from this point on, there's little of note. There's a little skirmishing action with the Persians in the Mediterranean, but nothing too eventful. What was actually eventful seems sort of like an odd decision, but the historian Arian says that it was due to the fact that Alexander, for one, didn't have enough money to support a navy, two, his navy was more or less like not quite as capable as the Persians, and to top it off was just his distrust of Greek sailors. So the disbanding of the fleet, now he had no choice left but to defeat the Persians by land. Soon, word reached Alexander that the great king appointed Memnon, arguably the best general, as commander of the Persian army and fleet in the war against the Macedonians. That new commander first moved his forces to Halicarnassus in the mountainous lands of Caria, south of where Alexander was. Halicarnassus in the mountainous lands of Caria, south of where Alexander was. Marching from Miletus to Halicarnassus, the Macedonians captured several small towns along the way, and as he approached the border of Caria, he was met by the former queen of Caria, Ada. Ada, this loved, respected, and legit ruler of the Carians, wanted to work out a deal with Mandilio. So there's this man by the name of Orontobates who usurped her throne, and so she wanted to offer help to Alexander if he would then help her with her own problem. Alexander agreed and was actually formally adopted by Ada. Weird, I know. Well, at least I guess that would give him legitimacy as an. At least. I guess that would give him legitimacy as an overlord in the eyes of the Carians, which was pretty important because then he was seen as a liberator and not a foreign conqueror. But regardless of his new mommy's help, Alexander arrived at the city and gazed in frustration knowing just how difficult it would actually be to conquer the city. And what follows here is really a bunch of back and forth. There's these series of hit and run attacks, engineering work, the usual siege warfare. And it all turned to a stalemate of sorts as summer turned to autumn and Alexander was still not making any progress. So Alexander, most likely fuming that it was taking so long, knew he had to take the city soon or withdraw before winter set in. Long though, Memnon decided his troops couldn't hold the entire city and ordered his men to set fire to the town. Then he and his fleet sailed in the night to the nearby island of Kos. So finally victorious, Alexander controlled the entire Aegean coast of Asia Minor from the Hellespont to Caria and thus he placed Ada on the throne of Caria as his satrap. Now with the camp thus he placed Ada on the throne of Caria as his satrap. Now with the campaign season being over, Alexander wanted to boost his men's morale. With many soldiers being newly married who had just left their wives at home, the king proceeded to send recent grooms home to spend winter with their wives. In the spring they could rejoin the army. Pretty smart move to be honest. Wars, and all these men become first-hand accounts on how Alexander is being a straight-up badass in Asia. You gotta make sure those back home know everything is going just splendid. So, once Alexander shipped all the young lads off, Parmenian took off with most of the cavalry to Sardis with orders to rendezvous with Alexander at Gordium in a few months. It's the amount of food needed from any one region, but it also freed Alexander of Parmenian being a stingy old man. Okay. At this point, many men have gone home, the army's in two, and it's winter. What would conventional wisdom be? Maybe chill somewhere, but surely not fight a war in the winter. Well, Alexander was never once really followed the norm, so he thought, so he thought, yeah, I'm just gonna go take my army and set off to the wild highlands of Lycia along the southern coast. So that's what he did. Alexander bundled up from the increasing cold, and the army marched through the mountains and along the coast almost 100 miles to the port of Telmesis, which he got without a fight. From Talmasis, he continued over the rugged mountains to the Xanthus River. From Talmasis, he continued over the rugged mountains to the Xanthus River and into the city of the same name. There, representatives of over 30 Lycian towns offered their submission to the king. Finally, Alexander's men arrived at the port of Phacelis. While there, Alexander received a report from Parmenian. It stated that the leader of the it stated that the leader of the Thessalian cavalry on his staff, Alexander of Lysentis, was conspiring with the great king to murder Alexander. And that put him in a hard spot. He knew the guy for being brave and capable, so he called upon his closest friends to help him decide what to do. And they all agree with Parmenian that a guy like that should be eliminated, since it wouldn't be smart to risk arms. He entrusted an envoy to Parmenian, instructing him to detain the guy, and he'd inspect the charges himself later. And then to fill that void in the Thessalian cavalry position, he appointed a guy named Erigius, his old friend. Gathering his army, Alexander then marched north from Phacelis over the pass at Mount Climax, and then down stretching some 50 miles along the shore. 
Moving about, Alexander got more gold, fresh horses, and various towns surrendered to him. And next up was Gordium. By the time he reached Gordium in the ancient kingdom of Phrygia, spring was just starting. Alexander was met by the Debbie Downer Parmenian, his men, and fresh recruits. Recruits. And it's here where a semi-historical event happens. Supposedly, there was this knot, the Gordian knot, that was pretty much impossible to undo. So, a legend grew around the knot, stating whomever could actually undo it would rule all of Asia. Now, this knot, made of rough bark, wound so tight that no ones were visible, pretty much, lo pretty much looked impossible, and probably actually was. So, examining the knot, Alexander just could not find a way to untie it. So, what he does, is he takes a step back, pulls out his sword, and just slices the knot in two. Well, I guess, like, a win's a win. Okay. Back to causing havoc in the Aegean, even making kissy faces at Athens and Sparta trying to get them to support Persia against Alexander. Frustrated and devastated at realizing he might have to leave the conquest to go back home to make sure he doesn't lose Macedonia and Greece, one of those oh-so-lucky things happen. Memnon suddenly falls ill and dies, and with the loss one of those oh-so-lucky things happen. Memnon suddenly falls ill and dies, and with the loss of such a great commander, the rest of the affairs in the Aegean become more or less minuscule, because along with his demise, potential rebellious ideas in Greece sort of halt, and even the great king himself is worrying about what to do without his favorite and arguably best general. The great king himself is worrying about what to do without his favorite and arguably best general. So, doing what great kings do, he called the meeting of his closest advisors and was like, advisors, bros, revisers, what should I do? Most argued that he himself should lead the army and crush the upstart Macedonian king once and for all. Greece mercenary leader from Athens named Caridemus strongly disagreed and told Darius not to risk it in a single battle. He said that he would take some Greek mercs, fight Alexander, and that the main army should stay in Babylon as reserves. Darius was pretty impressed, but his Persian council was like, nah, you're pretty stupid. So Caridemus and then the great king orders execution and pretty much immediately regretted it because that guy was also a pretty good general. So that sort of solidified the idea that Darius in a few months would have to lead the fight. So now we're in the second year of Alexander's campaign and it began with a march through the highlands which is the gateway to Syria. The satrap there, Arsimis, started doing a scorched earth policy to hinder the Macedonians only leaving a small guard at the Cilician gates. Alexander took his chance and led a small force in the night to the pass. By the morning, the Macedonians now held the most strategic position in Asia Minor, and in a continuous fleeing to Persia. Since it had been weeks since leaving Gordium, Alexander thought it ideal to rest and cool off from the heat. One of the first things he did was plunge completely naked into the river Sidnus. Unfortunately, that river was fed by melting snow from the mountain, so Alexander had no way of knowing that it was as cold as my ex-girlfriend. And immersed in water, Alexander had no way of knowing that it was as cold as my ex-girlfriend. And immersed in water, he began to cramp, freeze, and then just couldn't move. His friends actually had to rush in and carry him to his tent, where he'd spend the next few days hovering between life and death, with most of his men not knowing what would happen without their beloved king and fellow soldier. A physician who had an idea of saving Alexander's life. That guy was called Philip, and he was from Arcadia in northwest Greece. He was actually a trusted physician and had worked at the Macedonian court and even treated Alexander when he was a kid. So, he goes to Alexander and proposes that he would give him a mixture of sorts that would purge Alexander and if he actually survived those strong purging effects. So Alexander knew he had to risk it and he ordered Philip to start making the potion. And it's at that same moment, Alexander received a note from Parmenian saying, Beware of Philip, I have word that Darius has bribed him to poison you. So like earlier with the Alexander of Lysentis affair, him in a pretty difficult spot because he knew Philip his whole life. Was Philip trying to kill him or was Parmenian just trying to hasten Alexander's death and actually take over? He really wasn't sure. So Philip, still unaware of the message, comes back in the tent with the potion. And what happens next gives death and actually take over. He really wasn't sure. So Philip, Still unaware of the message, comes back in the tent with the potion. And what happens next gives genuine insight into Alexander's personality and character. So my guy takes the cup, 
starts drinking it, and at the same time sat and watched Philip finish reading the message. Truly mad lad. The expression on Philip's face didn't change though. He merely looked up at Alexander, shrugged, and said the medicine would quickly take effect. And over the course of three days, the king began to recover and would soon walk out of his tent to the deafening cheers of his army. But now there was little time left for cheer. He began his march through many cities and towns, going just beyond Issus. Alexander was now at the southern pass preparing to cross the mountains when his scouts told him that the Persians were now behind him on the narrow coastal plain near Issus. Immediately, Alexander recognized the tactical advantage this would have for his army over the numerous Persians. So, Issus. Alright, now picture this. It's a rainy November night. The Macedonians lay more or less trapped on a narrow plain with the strongest army in the world only a few miles away, waiting to destroy them. The sole path of retreat was behind them through the gates of Syria, only taking them deeper into enemy territory. As that rainy storm subsided and lit up the night, Alexander told his men to eat and prepare to leave before dawn. Alexander then led his army toward Issus, and nearing the Panaris River, and drew them in final battle formation. On the far right, he placed Nicanor with foot soldiers. Next to them are Macedonian cavalry, then thousands of infantry stretching almost to them are Macedonian cavalry, then thousands of infantry stretching almost a good mile. Finally, they leaped the Salian cavalry next to the sea. Parmenian held command on the left side, while Alexander was on the right toward the center. It was the classic formation that he used at the Granicus. With the Persians across on the far side of the river, Alexander's men advanced the final mile for Persian archer range. Alexander, sitting upon Bucephalus, rode back and forth along the lines, pumping up his army for the fight. Alexander then shouted and ordered them to advance at a run when he turned his horse toward the river. Alexander and his companions, with straight up super speed, rode forward quicker than the Persian arrows could even fire the front lines and set panic among the Persians. But suddenly the Greek mercs and the Persian army struck back hard into the Macedonian center, pushing them back into the river, killing many. With the Persian center holding, Darius sent his cavalry near the sea across the river to fight the Thessalians, but neither side gave way. Meanwhile, the Macedonian right wing began to advance. Meanwhile, the Macedonian right wing began to advance and break through, thus getting to circle around behind the Greek mercs. This was the moment the battle turned. Persians began to collapse, their cavalry fled back across the river, all the while Darius watched in horror. Then, Alexander spotted Darius in his war chariot. Alexander spotted Darius in his war chariot. He wanted to end the great king himself and rushed toward him. One of the great king's brothers comes in between them but gets cut down, and what happens next is frozen in time, preserved in a detailed mosaic. On it we see Alexander charging, his spear skewering a Persian standing between him and Darius. Dead they glittered on the ground, so it was over. At just 23, he defeated the great king of Persia in a battle, solidifying his ongoing conquest in Asia. After Issus, he won more than just glory though. Darius, dad of the year, left his family behind. But Alexander was a practical guy and treated them like royalty and with kindness. It was all good use of propaganda promotion like usual, and they could be a great potential bargaining ship in the future. The following day after the battle, Alexander went on to do the usual. He visited the wounded, did funeral rites for the fallen, honored certain people, and promoted some men to higher offices. You know, like the usual king and army commander stuff. And although he won, Alexander had some amounts of gold he thought he would have. Most of Darius's cheddar cheese was at the treasury in Damascus, several days of travel away. But he wanted the money like yesterday, so he sent Parmenian with a squad of 1,000 to go seize the treasury ahead of the army. At Damascus, the Persian satrap in charge wanted to surrender quickly in hopes of getting Persian satrap in charge wanted to surrender quickly in hopes of getting some preferential treatment. Despite that though, Parmenian still exercised caution while he approached the city. That crafty little satrap though didn't actually even tell his Persian subjects he was surrendering. He rather convinced them that they were going to flee to Babylon with all the treasure. So he had thousands of mules convinced them that they were going to flee to Babylon with all the treasure. So he had thousands of mules loaded with all the goods and sent everyone out through the city gates. It was so cold during the fleeing that all the attendants of the mules put on military uniforms while the refugees shivered. Here, Parmenian appeared on the horizon and spotted all of this. All he saw was a column of men and perched his men for battle. The mule drivers and refugees saw this and ran in terror. Slowly, he realized that these weren't soldiers and ordered them all to take everything to Alexander or be killed on the spot. After many days, caravans of goods arrived to Alexander and he was thrilled to say the least. 
decorated vases, war chariots, 500 pounds of silver, and probably enough gold to pay for several months. Not to mention all those refugees could now be pawns. Among them were relatives of Darius, and the chief prize in Alexander's eyes, Barsine. She was the widow of Memnon of Rhodes, a Persian by birth, but Greek educated. Said to be brilliant and charming, and a total smoke show, of course. Actually the first woman that Alexander fell in love with. Although they didn't marry, they did end up having a long affair, and eventually would have a son that they would name Hercules. Anyways, now our friendly neighborhood conqueror has some thinking to do about his conquest. Even though he defeated Darius at Issus, that was essentially just peanuts. If given enough time, Darius could summon an even greater force to fight Alexander. He knew his only chance of truly stopping Darius would be to chase him into the heart of the empire. But the thought of potentially losing everything he just gained in the west was also on his mind. So weighing his options, he planned to seize the Mediterranean coast of Lebanon, Palestine, and Egypt, while his generals in Macedonia and Asia maintained Persian threat closer to home. He knew he'd have to face Darius at some point, as Darius wouldn't allow Alexander to ravage his empire. But Darius would probably need at least a year to gather up a large enough army from the four corners of his realm. And when he would, that day would mark the greatest battle the world had ever seen. For now, the end of part one of Alexander the Great's life. In part two, the dude's life just gets cooler and even more great, no pun intended. Sorta. So get ready for more conquesting, borderline megalomania, and plenty of homicidal decision making. Also, comment anything cool you learned so far down below, and if you'd like to subscribe, that'd be pretty great. See you in the next one.